Hello and welcome back. So it's time to talk about photosynthesis. And this is one of our first energy transformations that we're going to be talking about. Um, we probably understand the basics of photosynthesis as this image, you know, kind of shows us we've got you know, light, carbon dioxide and water coming into a plant, uh, which then produces some form of food for the plant, in this case, carbohydrates and, uh, you know, oxygen comes out. You know, we know that plants suck in our carbon dioxide and spit out oxygen for us to use and it becomes this lovely little cycle. And this is done by all of our green plants. There isn't a green plant on the planet that doesn't go through some form of photosynthesis. So um, let's talk a little bit about it. Now, depending on where you're watching this, um, photosynthesis is removed from the 20, uh, from the, uh, sorry, <laughs> photosynthesis is going to be removed from the study designed for year 11 biology in 2022. So this may be more applicable to your understanding of photosynthesis for year 12 from then onwards. Um, as a result, I'm going to go into a lot more detail in this video than the year 11 uh, biology program dictates. Um, but probably I might skim a little bit over some of the more important points for the year 12s. Um, so uh, my apologies. If there's anything I miss, please feel free to leave it in the comments section below and I'll, uh, and I'll try to clarify that in a future video. Either way, let's get cracking. So we've seen this diagram before. Uh, this is the one that I used in a video, past video to do with uh, cell structures um, in eukaryotic cells. This is our chloroplast. I'm going to be pretty honest with you guys. I lied. This is very, very simply what a chloroplast looks like. And if you're going to see this in any diagrams or anything anyway, it won't look like that. It's going to look more like this. It's got a lot more complex layers. There's a lot more going on. Um, and if we go through the labels of the chloroplast, we can see that it consists of two separate membranes, an inner membrane and outer membrane, um, and then a space in between those membranes as well, which plays an important role in um, the, 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 the uh, energy, uh, sorry, the substances coming in and out of the chloroplast. The other thing that it's also got is this uh, stroma. Now, Strom is pointing to just the, the space, and it's the fluid membrane matrix, uh, you know, the medium that everything uh, sits in inside a chloroplast. And it's important because it actually has chemical reactions that take place inside of the stroma. Next, I'm going to talk about the granum, or grana. This, the, when I'm, we're referring to the granum or grana, we're talking about the stacks that are in uh, existing inside of the chloroplast, these green stacks, which are really, really green because they have our pigment stored inside of them. A singular uh, disc in the stack is known as a thylakoid. They're held together by this membrane that spans all the way through um, holding each thylakoid together, or each stack of granum together. But then if you crack open the thylakoid, again, there is another layer of uh, internal fluidy matrix inside of it known as the lumen. So there's a lot of different terms that you need to get you know, uh, into the brain and I try and remember. But most importantly, particularly if you're uh, a year 11 student, the things that you should probably try to focus on most are the stroma, thylakoid, granum. And of course, the general structure. But these three are the most important when we're talking about the year 11 content knowledge. Okay. Awesome. All right. So here it is. Here's our little diagram again. We have carbon dioxide coming in plus some water plus light energy. A lot of different places will, will have, you know, a lot of, sorry, different textbooks, a lot of different sources will have this drawn differently. In fact, I'm going to draw it a different way underneath in a second. Light energy coming in as part of the, uh, the inputs of our photosynthesis equation versus light energy as photons, which is part of the arrow, which causes the reaction to happen. Basically, it's kind of the same thing. You just need to remember that light energy is coming into this equation to create glucose and oxygen. Now, this needs to be kept in balance as well. The, the whole thing um, needs to be kept in balance. We're going to talk about that in a second. But the other thing to realize as well is that these uh, this equation isn't so set forwards. Like these things don't just come together like a re recipe, mix it all together, and then pops out some glucose and, and oxygen and some lovely little sugars for us to use. There's actually two different reactions. We have a light dependent reaction 
and a light independent reaction. And these two occur at different places in the chloroplast and I might be able to give a bit of a hint to that in a moment. Importantly to note as well is that this equation also uh, isn't just, you know, one of each creates it. So in actual fact, if we break this down to the chemical symbols, carbon dioxide is CO2, water is H2O, and then like I said, I'll draw this differently. So the arrow between them shows uh, this as light, you know, creating the, uh, the reaction between them creates glucose, which is C6H12O6. And we have some leftover oxygen molecules, which is not really used in this reaction by the plant. They are used by the plant later, but, uh, but yeah, so this is oxygen gas, so it is O2. Now at the moment, what's coming in does not equal what is going out. These little you know, numbers down below, each thing is saying how much of each a molecule or particle we have. So on this side of the equation, we have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Just like on this side of the equation, we have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. At this point, we have one carbon going in, but we have six carbons that need to come out. So this equation needs to be balanced. It really does need to be balanced a lot more. In this case, we know that if we're going to have six carbons uh, coming out, then we need at least six coming in. So instead of just having the two as a, a subscript next to it, to indicating that there's two of those individual molecules in this particular sub in this uh, particular substance, I'm going to put a big six in front of it. This tells me that I have six carbon dioxides going in uh, as part of the chemical equation. So if I've got six carbon dioxides going in, that accounts for six carbons. Tick. That's done and it accounts for 12 oxygens. There's six there and two there, so we're gonna end up with a few more oxygens towards the end as a bit of a leftover, but we'll talk about that in a second. Going in, we have two hydrogens attached in our water molecule. See the H2, that tells me I've got two hydrogens. I need 12 to create uh, glucose. So we need to increase this by a factor of six so that I have 12 hydrogens going in. So if I increase this by six, that'll give me 12 hydrogens going in and 12 hydrogens coming out. It also gives me another six oxygens that I'm working with, okay? So those six oxygens could be at the back here, but then I've also got 12 oxygens coming in here. So how do I balance this again? Well, I'm going to have a lot more oxygen coming out at the same time. So I'm going to have six oxygens coming out. So this equation is, is, uh, is balanced now. This is, a, this is what goes in and what goes out. There is another version of this equation, and I am going to inform you that, that it is actually more accurate to state that we, in fact, have 12 waters going in, 12 H2Os going in which increases the amount of oxygens that we are going to get out. We're actually going to get more like uh, 12 oxygens coming out. Uh, but, you know, we'll ignore that for the time being. So we actually have 12 waters that go into the reaction. Sorry, that's wrong. That's wrong. <laughs> that is completely wrong. Uh, 12 waters don't go in, uh, do go in, but we also have some water that comes out of the equation as well. <laughs> My apologies. We have six H2Os at the end. This is actually the more accurate version of the equation because we do have water that's a leftover byproduct as well of the reaction. It's used in the reaction and it is, uh, it's uh, taken from it. So you may want to jot this down. This is you know, quite important to know what the actual equation is. So I'm actually, uh, I'm going to scribble that one out and we should know that uh, we have six carbon dioxides going in, 12 waters, light energy then helps it to convert to uh, one glucose molecule, C6H12O6, six oxygen molecules and six leftover water molecules as well. So that was a lot of information. And for the rest of it, what I would usually get my students to do is to draw out this diagram. Um, I mean, I might provide a printed out version of it really, but for the purposes of this video, you're going to want to draw out this diagram so that you can start to understand the two different stages inside of the chloroplast. So this little jelly bean shape here is the, is the chloroplast. 
here is your thylakoid membrane. Uh, and you can see here that we have something coming in with something else, and then that is spitting out a product out the outside, so exiting the uh, the chloroplast. What doesn't end exit the chloroplast are two other molecules or two other substances which go into this reaction over here. So photosynthesis being a two-part reaction, you're going to want to break it down to these two parts, and then we're going to want to be able to talk through them. So maybe pause the video here, sketch this out, and then you know continue on well whilst taking notes from the rest of the slides as well. Another thing to realize is that when we're talking about energy inside of a cell, we're going to be talking about this molecule called ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. In the basics of understanding, we have an adenine uh, molecule. This is a type of nucleic acid that we have floating around in our body. It attaches to a ribose molecule, which is a specialized sugar molecule. Most sugar molecules are, um, are six carbon molecules, hence we, um, we see them with six sides. This one's only a five carbon molecule. And then it attaches to three phosphates, okay? Adenosine, triphosphate. Yeah, there's the triphosphate, the three phosphate molecules. The other version of this molecule is adenosine diphosphate with only two. This molecule here is what we use to represent energy because energy is stored in the bonds between the phosphates. When you go ahead and separate off a phosphate molecule, it releases energy for our cells to use. That energy being, you know, the electron particles that go on, uh, go become excited by the release of this, um, by the release of the energy from ATP. We then have this dormant state of ATP or ADP, which then gets fused together with another phosphate, which absorbs energy, usually from food or from other kind of source, and that then joins the uh, joins the, the third phosphate again to the chain to create ATP again. And this cycle continues over and over and over, you know, restoring energy, releasing energy, restoring energy, releasing energy. So when we're talking about energy and energy being used for cell, the cell, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about the third phosphate in ATP breaking off and then it becoming a, uh, an ADP molecule, which then, you know, stores some more energy. You, know, you can keep talking over and over and over, but then it would be a really long video. So we aren't going to do that. All right. The other thing to realize is uh, is is light waves. Um, and you may be thinking, well, hang on. Well, why are we suddenly talking about light? That's a physics concept, isn't it? We are in biology. Well, I mean, it'd be pretty hard for us to, to not talk about light when we're talking about photosynthesis because photosynthesis requires light for it to actually work. For us to understand this, we need to understand that the pigment that gives our trees their color and our leaves their lovely greenness is called chlorophyll. And most plants have one, have either one of these or both of these, and that is chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. As you can see, chlorophyll, the pigment, is what is, is what is responsible for absorbing light. And I'm going to show you why that is. So white light, the light that we see around us, is actually a combination of all the colors of the spectrum. So when it comes in and hits our plant, white light is all of the colors bombarding our plant. Now, we see things as green, or we see the, the the plant is green, you know, and depending on your current state, you might be colorblind, so the green might not be as green, or it could be gray, but whatever. They're meant to be green. Uh, so you, you get the green, it hits your eyes, that's what you see. That is because our green pigments absorb all of the other colors of light absor uh, from that white light around us, and then allow the green pigment to be reflected off. This is why we see this as green. Now, if you have a look at our, uh, whoopsie, there we go, <gasps> error. Uh, okay, <laughs> back to it. If you have a look at our spectrum here, you can see that chlorophyll B has a really high absorbency 
these lower wavelengths of light, the blues and the indigos, you know, while chlorophyll A has a higher absorbency at the higher wavelengths, your oranges and reds, this isn't to say that they don't absorb at the other ends of the spectrum, but they do have a higher absorbency at those ends. And then in the middle where there's those greens, there's not much absorbency. So this is why our plants are, are colored green and we get different colors as well, because they use different pigments. Carotenoids are more like your oranges. Um, you know, uh, there's a couple more names that not come into my mind, but these guys all absorb different uh, spectrums of light to become more efficient and this then offers another limitation to to uh, or one of the limitations to um, to photosynthesis which is you know the, the various colors of light you may have done an experiment using uh, cellophane and uh, chunks or leaf discs usually from like a fresh spinach plant we then uh, purge the spinach leaf, uh, spinach discs of all of their air make them sink to the bottom of the uh, to the bottom of the beaker and then activate, uh, sorry, cover it with a cellophane, put it under a grow lamp and try and get the leaf discs to uh, float. So the faster the rate of photosynthesis is under the various wavelengths of light, the quicker the plants, the, the leaf discs, the chloroplasts inside of them will produce oxygen as a byproduct, fill up those leaf spaces and then get the leaves to float again. That's a great experiment and a lot of people have used it. You probably will come across it sometime in your lifetime. So yes, we have our various, uh, we have our absorbency. We understand why our plants are green. We understand why we see them as green. We now get why we absorb light at different spectrums. It's time to talk about that light being absorbed in the first place. Let's talk about these two fellow, these two proteins inside of the thylakoid membrane. So I'm actually going to uh, get my. Uh, <laughs> Get my pen out. So this membrane here is on the outside of our thylakoid. Let's hope my pen works better today, shall we? There we go. So that's the thylakoid there. This here is the lumen on the inside. Uh, yep. And this one here is our outside. This would be our uh, our stroma on the outside of the uh, of the of the membrane. <laughs> okay, so we have our stroma, thylakoid, and lumen. I'm gonna actually uh, I'm gonna get rid of those for a second just so that I can draw them a little bit a uh, little bit better. So that's the thylakoid over there, that's the lumen, and that's the stroma on the outside. Perfect, be otherwise it'd be in the way for the rest of my drawings. Um, so what we have here is the light dependent stage happening inside of the thylakoid. We're going to end up getting this uh, these light particles, okay? So light waves come in and the light doesn't isn't the energy, the photons are the energy. Photons excite light particle, uh, excite electrons, and therefore these excited electrons will then help to drive the reaction. And they're going to pass along what we call an electron transport chain. That is a H or E T C for short. So there are various electron transport chains in biology. This one happens to be as part of the photosynthesis reaction, but we're going to, uh, and we will discuss the one that is part of our cellular respiration reaction as well. But for now, we're just going to focus on this one. So the light comes in and the photons travel down these little photosystems. The photosystems hold our green pigment. Yeah, this first one here is photosystem two. And it's then going to go along and we have also over here photosystem one. So first of all, um, it is a chain. So it is in fact going to work uh, along the chain from left to right in our diagram here. The light comes in, excites the, the uh, comes down, excites the electron, and then the electron shoots up to the top of the photosystem to activate the next stage of the reaction. Funnily enough, this is where water comes into it. Okay, so remember that we do have some molecules of water that come into this first part of the reaction. So water comes along, 
and these electrons need to come from somewhere to become excited. This is where the photon comes along and performs this process called photolysis. Lysis in any term means uh, to, to cut or to break in biology. So by breaking it up, we break up our water molecule and we're going to get one oxygen molecule or sometimes it's called half of an O2 molecule, but it's one oxygen. And then we're going to get two positively charged hydrogen ions. Now they're positively charged because this electron over here got excited and escaped. It went, it goes up into the photosystem. So it gets carried along by this, uh, this photosystem right to the top of photosystem two. And it then goes and uh, it activates another cascade. So the cascade goes along these two proteins here, whose names you don't need to know for the time being. But because of this cascade activating, it actually creates a uh, another um, uh, energy loop or energy reaction, which causes another hydrogen ion, positively charged hydrogen ion, to go from the outside to the inside of the uh, the thylakoid membrane. So you can see here we're starting to get a few different things happening. We, we've got this uh, this uh, this abundance of hydrogen ions on the inside of our uh, on the inside of our thylakoid uh, in the lumen, and we're starting to bring them our, it from the stroma. Okay. So now that we've done this, again, another light photon uh, comes along and excites the electron. Now this time the uh, the water does not get split because the electron traveled from photosystem two to photosystem one, uh, which by the way, bit of trivia, the reason we have two before one is one was discovered first and then they realized that photosystem two did in fact exist. Um, it's uh, just a bit of trivia. It's, uh, it sometimes comes up as a question. Hey, who knows? There you go. You might be able to credit me for a bit of assistance. Ha <laughs> ha. All right, so we have this uh, hydrogen ion that comes in. We've got the electron that gets excited again. It goes to the top of photosystem one, and this time it goes to a carrier protein, which actually brings a molecule called NADP plus into the equation. This molecule here is an electron carrier, okay? It is meant to come along, grab that excited electron, and take it to the, uh, take it to another reaction, now as NADPH. There it is. So this guy grabbed that excited electron, grabbed a hydrogen, a uh, hydrogen ion that was floating around outside as well, and then created NADPH, which is our carrier molecule. So this is a loaded electron carrier, and it's going to go off into another reaction that we're going to discuss in a second. Now, with all of these electrons passing pa passing through this uh, channel protein or this uh, carrier protein in the, the membrane, all these hydrogen ions starting to come into here, we, we're getting a bit of a concentration gradient. We've got a lot of hydrogen on the inside and not a lot of hydrogen on the outside. It's all moving against the concentration gradient via active transport. Hey, hey, look at that little bit of information that we needed to know from a previous lesson. And that's when we, uh, this, uh, funny looking protein comes into its own. This protein is called ATP synthase. Its role is to synthesize ATP. Floating around on the outside here, you're going to have an ADP plus PI, which basically translates to ADP plus a lonely phosphate molecule. When the hydrogen ion goes through this protein head here, it creates a reaction which collects an ADP and a PI and forms it into an ATP molecule. 
And you often see them with like a spiky edge like that because, hey, it's energy. Energy in there. All right, so this is the whole electron transport chain. And yes, I know that my drawings aren't the best and there's probably a few errors in here and I haven't named all of the proteins, but we have the important ones in there. We have a car we know that we have photosystem two. We have light photons, exciting electrons that photolysis takes into effect. I wonder if I can try and write that here. Photolysis, yes. Go, Lewis. All right, so photolysis has come into effect. It's cut this uh, water molecule into half an oxygen and two hydrogens. And uh, and hey, we're, we're going to do this a number of times. Interestingly enough, this is where we get our byproduct of oxygen, yeah? The hydrogen ions here, these two hydrogen ions, they get used over here down the track. Uh, to just continuously create C ATP synthase, which means that oxygen is going to be the byproduct. For every two water molecules, we get one oxygen uh, molecule left over, and that's where we get our uh, our waste product. Okay, so twelve oxy twelve water molecules are going into this, and then creating our six oxygens. Uh, so from this reaction, uh, this one alone, we are going to get. ATP, we're going to get NADP, oops, starting to lag, H, and we're also going to get oxygen. This one here is a byproduct and not used in. Uh, not used in photosynthesis. These two here are used in the next stage of the reaction. So this is our light dependent reaction where our electrons are getting excited and breaking it all apart. That's a really, really long explanation. I know for a simple one, but hey, um, no pause here, take a break, have a little bit of a stretch of your legs or something and then come back for, uh, for the next bit. All right. So once all that has happened, we come over to the next stage of the reaction. This is what we call the light independent reaction or Calvin cycle. Ooh. All right, so some people call it the dark reaction as well. That's not entirely accurate. I really like it for my students to understand this as the light independent even though really it can't really happen without it's an E reaction, even though it doesn't really happen without the light dependent reaction. But what I'm saying here is this one here doesn't happen inside of the thylakoid, okay? So this now happens outside. It happens in the stroma, that fluidy matrix that we were talking about before that is surrounding the, uh, the the thylakoid membrane and everything is sitting in. Um, and, and like I said, it's, it's often called the Calvin cycle. Uh, bonus points to anyone who goes off and can uh, maybe pop, put, pop in the comments section uh, the actual long full name of the Calvin cycle and, uh, <laughs> and maybe give some credit to the poor scientist who is always left out of this, uh, <laughs> this description. Okay, so this is where our carbon dioxide comes to it comes into it. Now I said that six carbon dioxide was coming into this, so only three carbon dioxides are, uh, uh, sorry, six carbon dioxides come into the whole photosynthesis equation. Only three of them are being used in this particular reaction. So this is going to happen twice. Um, and it's really important that we understand a couple of things. First of all is Rubisco. Rubisco is another carrier molecule. It's, um, it's going to, uh, to, to, uh, Sorry, Rubisco, being the carrier molecule, is going to carry the carbons all the way through this reaction. 
There's a few things that we do need to point out in this reaction, okay? First of all, the three carbon dioxides come in and uh, and the carbon molecules is what we're really after. Well, the carbon and the oxygens, but you know, we can see here that the carbon dioxide is being represented by one dot. So we have one, two, three, four, five, and six doubling, uh, um, that are ended off with these two phosphates as part of the, uh, the molecule. Um, <clears throat> the first, uh, the first stage of this reaction is what we call carbon fixation. So we're going to be breaking it down and fixing the carbon molecules to then create our our, uh, our glucose. <clears throat> so after car, so after our first step, where Rubisco grabs hold of these uh, carbon dioxides, they then break apart into three PGAs, or uh, it's a uh, phosphoglycerate is the uh, is the word. So three Phosphoglycerate. All right. So with these three PGAs, these three phosphoglycerates, which then have six ATPs come along, collide into them, and six NADPHs. This is stage here where the uh, ATPs and the NADPHs come along and give up some energy and then attach the hydrogen, so the electrons that are being carried with by the hydrogens to this reaction, um, go ahead and, uh, and reduce down this phosphoglycerate. <clears throat> and they create... <laughs> Glycyl aldehyde 3 phosphate or <laughs> G3P. Yes, I had to read that off a sheet and I always get it wrong. So if you have a better uh, pronunciation of it, please go for it. I'm going to write it down. So uh, please give me a second to do that. It is uh, gly. <laughs> Glyceraldehyde. Three. Phosphate. Whew. What a mouthful. All right, so these three glyceraldehyde, three phosphate, sorry, not three of them. We end up with six of them. Okay, at this stage in the reaction, we should have six of them. Now, if you can see here, only one of them breaks off at the end. So a 1G3P will go off to then make glucose. So at the end of this reaction, the product that we're going to have left over is in fact our glucose molecule. So the light independent reaction is all about making our glucoses. Uh, glucoses need six carbons. There's only three here at the moment. So, you know, at the end of this, we have one cycle and then we're going to have another cycle that goes through, which spits out another G3P, which then you know, will go ahead and create the full glucose molecule. Now, where there's six over here, we have to recycle five. Five G3P are then recycled and regenerated in this reaction. They're regenerated into... Uh, Ribulose biphosphate, all right? Or Rubisco 5-phosphate uh, is sometimes what it's called, but we get three of them out of this. Um, Ribulose biphosphate, okay. Again, another mouthful. <clears throat> and this is the cycle. It keeps going around and around and around. These guys then pick up the uh, three carbon dioxide, the ribulose biphosphate picks up the three carbon dioxides to become Rubisco again, which then breaks down into three GPAs, which then grab the ATPs and the NADPHs, which then become the three, <laughs> the G3P that breaks off. The five of them get recycled, regenerated. Regeneration, carbon fixation, reduction, regeneration, carbon fixation, reduction, over and over and over because it's a cycle. Yay. But at the end of this, we are going to end up with our wonderful energy molecule, glucose. 
As a year 11 student, am I expecting you to remember every single one of these names? No, no. To know that this exists, to know that this is what's going into this stage of the reaction, really I would just want you to know what goes in and what comes out. So we are going to have coming in six ATP, which means that is meant to be a T in the middle, ATP, which means from the last reaction we needed six ATPs uh, at least. Well, actually we need nine because, uh, sorry, no, we don't, we need six, we need six ATPs at the least. Um, uh, uh, and then we're going to end up with six NADPHs coming in out of this reaction we are going to get 6ADP plus PI and 6NADP plus. We're also going to end up with 1C6 H12O6 molecule, which is our byproduct. It's not used in photosynthesis. It is the product of photosynthesis. Ooh. Oh, that'll do. You guys get the word. All right. Another absolute mission of slides, but hey, we're at the end now. This is what your jelly bean diagram should look like towards the end of the lesson, okay? We have the light photons coming in, water coming in, and oxygen coming out of the light reactions, as well as ATP and NADPH, which goes into the stroma, into the Calvin cycle, which has oxygen, uh, sorry, carbon dioxide come in, glucose come out, which sends the ADP back to the light reactions and the NADPH back to the light reactions so they can become loaded up again. That's a cycle in the middle there. There's a cycle over here and this one. Well, it's not a cycle. It's a chain. It's the electron transport chain. Crikey, what a lesson. Okay, we discussed the chloroplast. We went over photosynthesis's chemical equation, including the distinction between the light and dark stages. We looked at a diagram model that you could pop into. We talked about ATP, ADP, chlorophyll, and the light absorption was next. Light-dependent reactions being the electron transport, the light-independent reactions being the Calvin cycle, and then, of course, the final diagram, which you guys can use for your notes if you wish. That is an absolute monster of a lesson thank you for dealing with me and um yep i i think i'm gonna just put this up as one take why not let's just do one take sounds fun